Off the piers in southwestern Michigan, a lot of anglers have been going for brown trout like this. But one day, about a week ago, Jim Lamb was out there with your brother Tag. Nobody was on the pier. Why not? Rain was coming down. Pouring down, and you were all by yourself. Yeah. Well, what did you catch? 30-pound, 12-ounce brown trout. Look at this. What a story. There has to be to go with it. You're going to hear about that in just a moment. Also, the beginning of bass season and a lot more. Stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. It's Thursday night. Time for Michigan Outdoors. From the rugged shore and woodlands of the north, it's history of copper mines and iron ore, the Great Lakes fisheries. A Canada Goose fanfare opened uh, bass season in southern Michigan for you, Bob Garner. And Kerry Cammer there in the lead with his tackle boxes and rod. And there's Bill Rustin with his tackle boxes and rods. And there's Bob Garner. Uh, Bob, you don't have any rods or tackle boxes. No, they're carrying the rods and tackle boxes because I, I thought I should watch <laughs> guard over the food, I guess. <laughs> Thermoses, you know, donuts, that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, okay. Well, you, all the supplies there on board, plenty of lures. You're in a lake on the opening day of bass season. A small, well, not so small, private lake. Yeah, there are, there are hundreds of these around Oakland County and probably another hundred or so with public access, and they're all good bass fishing, for especially opening day. You know, the funny thing is a lot of people think that these lakes have, a lot of them have a number of weeds in them. Oh, they're very weedy lakes. And they have boat traffic, they have houses around them, they have swimming docks, and people say, well, there can't be too many fish oh. there, they're fished out. Hey, if you know what you're doing fishing in these lakes, you can catch a big fish and lots of them. In fact, right under a swimming platform like that is a great place. That's always catch. good for one fish opening morning. Now, I happen to know you guys prefer spinner baits. That's, that's the preferred bait seems to be on that lake, especially on op opening day. White or, um, oh, I chartreuse. don't know. Chartreuse, yeah, that's another good one, too. But look, it just caught a little fish, though. Uh, just in the first 10 minutes, but usually by then we've got a half a dozen, so we knew that something wasn't really kosher. Well, it was, it was foggy, it was hazy. We've had a lot of changes in the weather in the past couple weeks, which has put the fishing up and down. Bill Rustum casting... <laughs> Did he use a spinner bait to start off with? No, yeah, he did, but then he changed to a crankbait and he got this fish on. Now this, this fish was the heaviest fish of the day and it took the line right out around the boat, made a tremendous battle. He had it on for a couple of minutes here and uh, what a fish. But that fish had to be almost five pounds. Well, you'll see it when it comes up here. Some people like fishing Ooh. when the sun is out. But I like conditions like this. It had the kind of placid, quiet, you can see every ripple in the water. Look, well, at, that. That. Look at that Look at that fish, oh, Fred. Wow. That is a, a southern Michigan bass, I, I almost said typical, but it, it honestly is a typical bass that lives in these waters. Knowing how to catch him is something else. 20 inches right on the nose for that fish, too. Incredible fish. Anybody who thinks Michigan is not a bass fishing state yeah. has another thing coming because we do have a tremendous number of bass. I think they're just overshadowed by all the types of fish we have, oh, sure. the walleye, the pike, the muskie, the, of course, the salmon and trout. Kerry Kammer, former state senator Kerry Kammer, now in the Natural Resources Commission, uh, went to a crankbait. Of course, there, right there, you're looking at one of the detriments of a crankbait, picking that's, up weeds. That's right, and Kerry was reluctant to try it. Of course, you know, too, Kerry was a 1982 Michigan bass champion, and he really is a believer in the spinnerbait, but he changed his mind. Well, that spinnerbait, you can see right there, the hook rides up instead of hanging down like a crankbait, but it just wasn't producing for you guys on opening day. And look what Rustum does again. He pulls out, what, a three and a half pound bass, maybe there, maybe close to four. I couldn't believe it. And you were still sticking with the spinnerbait. Spinner bait. You said, hey, it's always produced before. Fred, I got confidence in it, and look at, <laughs> look at that, look at that. That's okay. a different bass than the other one. That's a little bit smaller. It's just a little bit smaller. That's probably 18 inches, 18 and a half inches. This one also goes into the live <laughs> well. That's two you kept temporarily. Now, I know Kerry is a tournament bass fisherman, right. and he likes to turn his bass back. And that doesn't bother me because bass aren't that good at eating anyway. Well, they're 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 okay. They're okay. Here, so here's another fish. Just comes right up and it grabs that crankbait. I don't understand it. Usually spinner baits are the best thing in the world for fishing down there, but but this one grabs it and Rustum's got it again. Incredible. Well, <laughs> and he converted Kerry Camera to crankbaits on this morning. Absolutely. And I think this is Kerry swinging another one aboard tournament style. You see the big lip on that crankbait, drives it down deep. And of course, Kerry has a whole arsenal of crankbaits. 
We were running crankbaits down about three feet uh, when I switched for a little while to a crankbait, but I had no confidence in them. You can cast right over logs. Uh, even though the hooks hang down and can catch on weeds, if you know what you're doing and how to walk them over those logs, you saw a couple pop over right there. It can be done, and that's where the bass lie. Bass like structure. They like weed beds. They like air. Oh, look at this. Double header. Right over the weed beds. And look how, the, look how those fish were hooked. They were really slapping at the baits, just slapping at that crankbait. Both those taking on crankbaits. Both of them keepers, too. But you were easy keepers. Of course, this is spawning time. This is when the, the fish are in the shallows, they're laying their eggs, and it's been a little cool this spring, which has held the bass on the beds. I imagine there's still bass on the beds in some parts of the state. I'm sure there are, but boy, they do scrap. They do scrap. And you sat by throwing your spinnerbait and watching, hey, you know. watching Rustam and Cammer. Look at that. They already had a, a pair of, or he, Rustam had a, had a pair of big fish in the boat, one of them close to five pounds. And I wanted to fish something different on hopes of taking a great big fish. But look at this fish. Look at this fish coming up here. carrie has got that one on. Tell you one thing I might mention here, it is mighty nice to have somebody in the Natural Resources Commission, the more the better, who are fishermen and hunters. Now that's, that's the greatest thing about it. And then Bill Rustam too, who, who's, look, look at that fish. Now that was actually the longest fish of the day. That was 20 and a quarter inches. Although it was not the heaviest. It was not the heaviest fish of the day. There's the smallest fish of the day caught by Kerry Kammer on a spinnerbait. The smallest There's the, fish. The heaviest fish, you can see it's full of eggs. Bill Rustam caught that one. Uh, close to five pounds, maybe a little over five pounds. There's some spawning beds. You can see those circular rings up near shore. That's where the bass and then later the bluegill move into those same beds and spawn. Now there's a bass. I think, Bob, this might have been the bass that suckered finally for your spinner bait. <laughs> finally, towards the end of the day, you got one on. I finally came up with one. <laughs> of respectable size. Yeah, well, good morning, efficient. Look at him battle. Okay, you got him in the net. I tell you, that's that you proved, Bob, that you can catch him on spinnerbaits. Do you wish you would have changed to a crankbait? Heck yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way it goes. Best fishing opener for Bob Garner in Michigan Outdoors. I tell you, it's been so hot off of South Haven, a 26 and a half pound lake trout was caught last week plus a huge brown trout, and we have it right here. Jim Lamb called me last week. He said, I caught a whopper of a brown trout. How big? 30 pounds, 12 ounces. Close to the state record, just a few pounds off. You weren't out in a big boat trolling the Great Lakes in a $50,000 cruiser, were you? No, we were just off the piers. Fishing off the pier at which, which pier? South Haven North Pier. The North Pier of South Haven, which a lot of times is wall-to-wall -wall fishermen. Yeah. Uh, what time do you usually get out on the pier to get a spot? Well, normally you have to get out there about 3 4 o'clock. In the morning? In the morning. And what about this morning? Well, that particular morning, it was pouring down rain. There wasn't a person there, not a soul. Were you very optimistic on a rainy day? Mm, yeah, anytime you're by yourself, that's OK. That's OK, I, I guess so. A near state record brown trout. Your brother Tag was with you. What happened, Tag, when, you, when, when he got this fish on? He said, don't, don't lose it, it could be a new state record. You, did you really think it could be a state record? Well, after I finally saw it, I did. How long did it take you to see it? Uh, about 15 minutes. What a battle. What a battle. Did it, did it really fight much, or was it like dragging a big log in the water? No, it was a good hard fighter. It wasn't like a fast fight, like the King's mm -hmm. fight. You know, it was, I thought at first I had a big old laker on. But Tag was on the net. Yep. He scooped it up. And you had no, no crowd to gather. No, nope, not <laughs> at all. I had a couple perch fishermen to show it to, and that was it. A rainy, what were you using for bait? Live alewives. Live ones? Mm hmm That seems to be an up-and-coming bait in the Great Lakes. Mm-hmm. It's a natural, sure. natural bait for them. Now, I imagine the, piers, the, the North Pier at South Haven is going to be mighty crowded this weekend after people see what was caught. It has been. I bet it has. I, have you gotten your same spot uh, after that? Yeah, like a couple days afterwards I got the same spot, but... Uh, the weather was too nice, and they were catching a few small browns. That was about it. So if you want to fish with Jim Lamb and his brother Tag and maybe see him get a state record fish, go out on a lousy, rainy morning. Get there about 3.30 or 4, huh? Yep. Because you're going to be there. You're from Paw Paw? Yep. Big news in the hometown of Paw Paw. Jim Lamb, congratulations. I'd shake your hand, but I know a 30-pound fish. <laughs> I'll shake the tail of this. What a whopper. How about this for big news in the outdoors, Bob? 
DNR Interim Director Gordon Geyer has appointed an action team, or as I call it, an A-team, to look into the structure of the DNR. Now, Bill Rustam is chairman of that A-team, and I asked him why he's so optimistic that hunting and fishing issues are coming to the forefront in the department. Well, I think we have the benefit today of some, some good, strong leadership, both on the Natural Resources Commission uh, and Commissioner Kammer and others who are very, very interested in, in those conservation issues. And I think in Dr. Geyer, as an interim director, we have a, uh, a man who is uh, both committed to, to those programs as well as environmental protection and has a kind of an enthusiasm about him uh, that I think will make a difference uh, over the short term in bringing the department back to the forefront in, in conservation issues. We blame winter a lot for loss of wildlife, but the week's worth of cold rain a couple of weeks ago didn't help out the feathered wildlife at all. Problems occur when the young chicks get wet over a period of a couple of days or the hen won't let them get out to food. The chicks either starve or die of loss of body heat, and biologists aren't sure exactly what the total loss is at this time. In fact, they won't know much until the pheasant, turkey, and grouse brood surveys are tabulated in August. And although the wet weather doesn't bother the young ducks very much, dry marshes do. Thanks to Ducks Unlimited and its supporters in Michigan, three of Michigan's important waterfowl nurseries will get a new look that will make them even more attractive to ducks and geese. The wetland projects in which the DU share is about 200 grand encompass some 2,782 acres in Monroe, Iosco, and Delta counties and are part of a joint effort between Ducks Unlimited and the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. When completed, the wetlands will provide breeding and staging areas for both local and migrating waterfowl. Dr. Howard Tanner, former DNR director and the person most responsible for our Great Lakes salmon success, has called for a cutback in the amount of lake trout planted in the Great Lakes. Because lake trout grow slow and are fatty by their nature, they tend to register higher levels of contaminants such as PCBs. Tanner says that since salmon grow faster, they don't show the same problem as the Lakers and therefore aren't as susceptible to contaminants. It's a point well taken, but it's probably going to get the same reaction as poking a stick in a hornet's nest. There is some important lake trout research going on this summer, and it's kind of a combination of sea hunt and star trek that will be taking place in July and August in Lake Superior and Lake Huron. For the second time in two years, Michigan State's University's Dr. Bill Cooper and his brother, Dr. Richard Cooper, from the University of Connecticut, will team up with a national underwater research program to take us to the icy depths of Lake Superior and to go where no man has gone before and live to tell about it in Lake Huron. Using the same submarine that took this videotape in total darkness, 600 feet deep in Lake Superior, and was used to locate part of the ill-fated shuttle off the coast of Florida, Researchers hope to unlock the mysteries of lake trout spawning, which only occurs naturally at the present time in Lake Superior. Well, for those folks who get hooked on fishing after they try their two-day free fishing permit, you ought to get a hold of a digest here. Heck, our shows have been on walleye, stream trout, brown trout, pike, live bait, bass this week, bluegill next week. We have a whole summer of fishing ahead, Bob. It's going to be a lot of fun. Got a great question from the mailbag. <laughs> from uh, Steve Taylor from Olivet, who's a biology teacher, and they've been talking about alternative sources of protein in a diet. See, we're on to a food question here. <laughs> and he says, can you put me in contact with a source where I might obtain information about using insects and other natural foods? Bob, have you ever had a bug burger? Like, or, or, or fried carpet beetles or something like no. that? No, sir. <laughs> no, Some, thanks, Fred. Have you got an answer to that? I, well, I yeah. don't know. We, we found Dr. John Callis from uh, Department of Food Science and Human Nutrition at Michigan State University says there are a lot of cultures uh, and across some oceans that eat these things and get a lot of protein out of them. Uh, author Ron Taylor wrote a couple books, one, Entertaining with Insects, <laughs> Original Guide to Insect Cookery, and the classic, Butterflies in My Stomach. <laughs> <laughs> Information on how to get that is here in the Outdoor Everything Digest. Everything you wanted to know about That's eating right. butterflies. I don't think we're going to do a recipe on them, though. Fred, we've got an easy question for you from Charles Moore of Bay City. He writes and he says, what happens to the antlers of deer? Hunting for more than 30 years, I have found only one horn in the woods. I mean, I think he means antlers. Here. Antlers is what he's talking about. This is an antler of an animal. They're shed every year, every fall. Uh, they come off, or actually in the winter, February is a big month for that. And this antler came off of an elk out in New Mexico where I was hunting, but you can see there's little marks all, all the way up here. And what these are is teeth marks. And there's one spot that was a weak spot here that was eaten probably by a squirrel, squirrels, mice, porcupine, porcupine rabbits, yeah. all kinds of things eat the antlers because inside the antler is a lot of calcium and phosphorus. And as the antlers lay in the woods and soften up, 
they become very easy to consume, and that's what happens to the antlers. They're eaten by a lot of rodents. I'd rather eat an antler than a carpet beetle. That's right. <laughs> well, now, folks, let's see if you can answer this question in our outdoor quiz. What is the highest price ever paid for a hunting permit? In 1981, the Wyoming Fish and Game Department gave a bighorn sheep hunting permit to the North American Wild Sheep Council for a fundraising auction. The permit sold for a record $43,000. Who makes the biggest splash at the outdoor fair? None other than our own Bob Garner. Once again, the dunk tank will be a focus of attention. You'll see Bob Garner, Kathy Beitler, and myself take our turns. You shoot an accurate arrow, hit the ball, and we'll drop in the water. The last weekend in June at the Houghton Lake High School, this is where the biggest and best, I think, outdoor event of the year takes place. We're going to have, I predicted originally, 50 outdoor manufacturers and organizations. Let's bump that up to 75. Things are going gangbusters. We're going to be running continuous videotape seminars taken from our most popular Michigan Outdoors TV features. In the gym, we're going to have continuous seminars on boating and bow hunting and air rifles and strategies for fishing Houghton Lake and behind the school at the shooting range. We're going to have seminars going on there and demonstrations on showing how muzzleloaders, handguns, and shotguns are used safely and how they shoot. And you'll have an opportunity to try one of these guns for the first time under the supervision of an expert. If you're an archer, you're going to have to bring your bow because the Flint Bowmen have lots of activities lined up, including a Golden Arrow 3D silhouette course in the woods, a long-distance shoot at Old Slough Foot. That's well over 100 yards, actually closer to 150. Use hunting equipment. If you hit the crest in a Stroh's can, you could win thousands of dollars worth of prizes. Last year, a shooter came within an inch. Ron LeClaire is going to demonstrate how to shoot 50 cents out of the air with his longbow. He has some new aerial shooting demonstrations there. He did it for us a few years ago. He's going to be back again. Chuck Lowe is bringing bird dogs, showing the training of pointing dogs. Max Schneider from the Michigan Coon Hunters is going to give some dog training demonstrations with hounds. Our first internationally sanctioned Stroh's duck calling contest will take place on Saturday. Bob Girat, Jim Schruger will give calling lessons each day. And on Houghton Lake, next to the Limberlost, we have a whole array of water activities. Of course, the retrievers and duck hunting demonstrations by the Michigan Duck Hunters Association will be back. A new addition will be the Coast Guard Auxiliary putting on a water and kids show and a very entertaining boating show for adults with the Walleye Brothers. <laughs> They're quite an entertaining act. Plus complimentary boat safety inspections at Spicer's Boat City across the street. Also, if you catch a nice Trophy fish, it doesn't have to be a Stroh's Award winner or a Master Angler fish, but bring it to the outdoor fair. We're liable to put you in the trophy book. The Houghton Lake Lake Association will have a special display on ice of big fish taken that weekend. Muzzle Loaders Village, while Guy and Evelyn Swan thought that maybe we'd have 100 people there, it looks like we're going to have 100 families camped in colonial encampments. On Saturday, they'll put on a colonial fashion show in the auditorium. On Sunday, a reenactment of a French and Indian war battle on the athletic field. By the way, on Saturday, we're going to try our first gun and knife show. One day only. Buy, sell, and trade should be a big attraction, something new for the fair. And on Saturday, four concurrent all-day wildlife art workshops. Nick von Frankenheisen, popular DNR artist and photographer, will give a course on wildlife painting. On the subject of wildlife photography, especially 35 millimeter, Tom Sterling gives an all-day workshop teaching equipment and how to get close to a variety of birds and animals. Jim Wicks, well-known decoy carver, will present an all-day class on carving for novices and experts. Learn how to do it in about six or eight hours. And Brad Bruce, president of the Taxidermist Association in Michigan, gives a hands-on class start to finish on mounting deer heads, never before offered in Michigan. Pre-registration is necessary for all these all-day workshops. So rev your engines towards Houghton Lake June 27th through the 29th. It's going to be a spectacular outdoor hunting, fishing, shooting sports show, something the likes of which hasn't been seen in Michigan outdoors. If I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times, <laughs> but this, I mean from the bottom of my stomach, <laughs> this recipe is a fish recipe that no one in this world could dislike. Oh, this, no, not at all. This is incredible. Are you ready for second, Chef Bob? Hey, you bet. 
Uh, in fact, save the rest of that for me. Well, I'm going to scoop that out of my plate because I'm down to the, the potato part here and I'm going to, I want to get a little more of the fish. I am surprised. Isn't it great? I looked I'm, at this recipe and said, nah. I'm, well, this is one of the recipes that did not make our, uh, the finals in our recipe contest was submitted this, past, for it. this past March. And who sent this in? Anita Donders from Sears. From Sears, and it's called... Uh, Fish and Fries. Fish and Fries. Oh. Bob, you thought there was rice in it when you first tasted it? I thought it? there was rice in it. I was going to say, hey, rice tastes pretty good in this. But, hey, there's no rice. Nope. But can you taste the curry powder? <laughs> Ooh, I oh, love I could it. smell it when it's cooking. But it isn't strong. No. And there's the rice. That's what you thought was rice, is tater, tater tots. tots. And mayonnaise. A different combination of ingredients. It, it really Milk. is. And fish fillets. And we used salmon on this. Yes. Very nice looking salmon at that. Wasn't real thick. Fillets that were trimmed don't have the dark meat on it, don't have the bones in it. Just go lay these in a dish, buttered casserole dish. Get milk. You don't need a whole lot of milk because you're going to put a whole can of soup in. And mayonnaise. And I think the real mayonnaise will stay together better than like Miracle Whip. Think so? Mm hmm. In well, cooking, yep. Well, on top of that, put old celery soup. Cream of celery soup. Like I say, it's a different mm. ingredient. Curry powder now, like, this is what I could smell when it was cooking, and there's not that much in here. This is ground curry. There's it's thousands Indian, of different. An Indian that's right. uh, type of spice. That's right. But does it, just that little just bit. Just that little bit, and you can, I can taste it. I can, I can just get a hint Just a of hint, it. that's right. Bob, Better mix this up and pour <laughs> it over the top of the fish. <laughs> I wish you folks could see the look on Bob's <laughs> face as we're stirring up this compote. There's the tater tots. They go in on top of the fish. Yep. Now you could use french fries for this. Anita you said you so? could. Yeah, Anita said you could use french fries or tater tots. I wouldn't change this. No, I wouldn't yet. either. You got your whole meal basically right there in one dish. And there's the combination of uh, uh, Miracle Whip salad dressing, mayonnaise, uh, cream of celery soup, milk. And the curry. Yep. On top of that. Put fresh parsley. You oh, use yeah. canned, but the fresh is really good. Makes, makes oh. a big difference. I you tell you, how long do you bake that for? About an hour, 50 minutes, 45, 50 and minutes. And here it is. Of course, this is half gone right now, and Bob, you're ready for another little nip. Oh, <laughs> isn't not it? a little bit. Don't say little bit. <laughs> to Bob Carter, a little bit. <laughs> this is an amazing, Fred, amazing recipe. You, you know, we've often discussed this. That my wife has this no curry edict yes. throughout the house. She can't stand curry, and I love it. <laughs> I, I love recipes with curry in it, and you can't taste a lot of curry in this. No, you but, can't. But, but... This this is just great. Everything I'd like tastes to have Beth good try together. This. It would be good with walleye, mm -hmm. or probably most any fish, but with salmon. Oh, this everything is works everything in this just recipe. Out, if somebody says it together, so I don't like it. fish, oh, they'd like this. They'd yes. love it. They'd yep. love it. This is a great one. Well, I tell you, maybe you can get outdoors and catch a big fish this weekend. Maybe one of those big brown trout off the piers oh, would be terrific be this wonderful. way. Bluegill, whatever. I tell you, it's a great place to be. We're going to be back next week with the show Bluegill Fishing. So join us, won't you? It is mighty nice to have somebody in the Natural Resources Commission, the more the better, who are fishermen and hunters. Now that's, that's the greatest thing about it. And then Bill Rustam, too, who... Who's, look, look at that fish. Now that was actually the longest fish of the day. That was 20 and a quarter inches. Although it was not the heaviest. It was not the heaviest fish of the day. There's the smallest fish of the day caught by Kerry Kammer on a spinnerbait. The smallest There's the, fish. The heaviest fish, you can see it's full of eggs. Bill Rustam caught that one. Uh, close to five pounds, maybe a little over five pounds. There's some spawning beds. You can see those circular rings up near shore. That's where the bass and then later the bluegill move in. Spinner bait. <laughs> finally, towards the end of the day, you got one on. I finally came up with one. <laughs> of respectable size. Yeah, well, good morning, efficient. Look at him battle. Okay, <laughs> you got him in the net. I tell you, that's... That you proved, Bob, that you can catch them on spinnerbaits. Do you wish you would have changed to a crankbait? Heck yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it goes. Best fishing opener for Bob Garner in Michigan Outdoors.